Colombia has seized one of the world's most wanted drug traffickers in a major operation supported by the United States and the United Kingdom. Hundreds of Special Forces troops took part in the capture mission and the arrest is being hailed as the most significant blow to drug trafficking in the country since the death of Pablo Escobar. Welcome, Hot TV viewers, to uh, DML's show about coca leaves and uh, cocaine. Uh, as a drug historian, I've learned a few things uh, in my uh, time researching this topic. Uh, number one, uh, the uh, drug lords who get arrested, for example, yesterday, it's October 25th, 2021, and October 24th. 2021, they arrested another Colombian drug lord, biggest one ever. Um, but these drug lords that they arrest uh, are, are never really the top tier drug lords. They're just the guys, uh, the ethnic guys, uh, non-whites, uh, who are the fall guys for the, the drug operations that uh, tend to be organized by the CIA. And we have some links um, with evidence of that uh, that we will provide for you. Um, another thing I've learned uh, is that uh, coca tea and coca leaves and chewing coca is not the same thing as doing a line of blow. Surprise, surprise. Coca leaf has 14 alkaloids, only one. Cocaine is, has been researched, really, at all. And um, the coca leaf is uh, quite a powerful medicine, very useful, uh, difficult to abuse. Uh, you can drink coca tea before bed and it might keep you up, but apart from that... There's no real health problems associated with using coca leaves. Another surprising thing, probably the most uh, interesting thing I've learned in my research, is that the medical establishment uh, in Western society, at least, tends to um, demonize non-proprietary medicine and um, uh, extol the virtues of proprietary medicine in, in spite of any evidence to the contrary. So uh, you see that with cannabis, of course, and you see that with herbal medicine in general, and you see that with uh, the other illegal herbs, uh, poppies, uh, coca leaves, ma medical marijuana mushrooms, or not marijuana mushrooms, sorry, magic mushrooms, uh, kratom, um, alternatives to the vaccine, you name it, anything that you can patent, uh, the medical establishment, the pharmaceutical companies, doctors, uh, the media, they're not interested in hearing about it, but uh, we're interested in telling you about it, so we're going to do a whole show on coca leaves and cocaine. This is kind of an expansion of my article, um, The Amazing World of the Coca Leaf, which you can read now at Cannabis Culture, and uh, we'll provide the link for you. Okay, so The Amazing World of the Coca Leaf. Now you can see this is a coca leaf, and it has a lot of veins and stuff going through it. And uh, you can tell it's a coca leaf. It has these two extra lines uh, that uh, follow along the main intersecting line in the middle. Uh, there's a line on each side, major vein system there and uh, that's a Bolivian one up top and that's a Colombian one below and there's the lines there you can see the two extra lines that follow the main vein and these are uh, just kind of pictures of coca leaves I found on the internet it's quite a beautiful little leaf uh, these are uh, coca seeds and coca flowers that uh, you find on a coca plant uh, coca seeds don't travel very well, so it's difficult to export coca from one place to another um, through the uh, the seeds. They they tend to only last for a few days, and the germination rate is poor. Uh, there's another uh, view of the flowers on a coca plant, and that's what uh, the uh, plant looks like as just a day or two after germination. Um, and yeah, the uh, Latin name is Erythroxylum coca. There is uh, what the shrub looks like, and there's a kind of a pullback wide shot of the seeds. And um, 
coca can grow to 18 feet, but uh, for the purposes of cultivation, it's uh, usually grown to about six feet, as you can see here in these photos, four, five, or six feet. And that's a that's an 18 foot coca tree, though. And that's what coca means, uh, the tree, in the original language. Uh, the use of coca goes way back, um, 8,000 years at least. We're finding out it goes back further and further. Every There's evidence for it going back more and more. Um, you'll see a lot of ceramics with a bulge in a cheek uh, in uh, South America, and these are the, the coca chewer ceramics. This one is um, 5,000 years old, about, or more. And... Uh, as a religious significance, it's been incorporated into Christianity, actually. There's uh, uh, the uh, patron saint of Coca, uh, Maria, and uh, there's uh, Mama Coca as well, who is uh, a uh, Coca deity. And you'll see uh, depictions of Coca leaves on pottery. For let's hundreds, if not thousands, of years old, and um, coca needs a uh, alkaloid, uh, an alkaline activator, either uh, crushed up uh, seashells or uh, lime, the mineral lime, or uh, burnt uh, ashes of various plants used to activate the ingredients when you're chewing it, and um, the uh, Alkaline activator is uh, kept in various um, containers, including this elaborate gold container. And uh, there are depictions of shamans using coca and tripping out. I guess when you fast uh, and you use a drug, any drug, uh, the effects are uh, potentiated, more potent. So you'll see... Uh, um, a hallucinatory dose of coca might happen if you fast and take a lot of it. But there's a chewer, a uh, ceramic, uh, the bulge, the cheek bulge. This image is from the Coca Museum in Peru. And uh, yeah, Google uh, images or Google Maps, the, the photo collection at Google Maps has a good collection of images from the Coca Museum. There's another ball, cheek bulge ceramic. There's another uh, depiction of the use of coca on pottery, and you can see they're uh, dipping their lime stick in in their container of of lime or alkaline matter. And there's another cheek bulge ceramic. Another cheek bulge ceramic. There's tons of these. There, there's a very popular depiction of coca chewers. Uh, in history, there's but you can see the something in that cheek right there. And there's another one, and there's another one. And this is a depiction of the Europeans meeting the coca goddess when they arrive in the New World. Uh, the Spaniard being meet, met by Mama Coca. Here's a different depiction of that. And there's another coca chewer. And this is a image from about the 1600s uh, made by the Spanish conquistadors of a uh, person sharing coca leaves. And this is from 1777, and it is a botanical uh, visualization, a drawing of coca. This is from 1860. Here's some more botanical drawings, 1868, 1885. You can see the two lines that go alongside the main vein there as well. And this is a book, one of many, by Angelo Mariani, who was the uh, purveyor of coca wine. Vin Mariani, it was called. And he uh, tried to educate a lot of people about coca. And this is one from 1900. And this is uh, one from 1918 on a wall. And 
there is a more contemporary, more modern depiction of the plant, botanical. And uh, this is actually uh, one from 1854. And um, I quote from that book in my article. And this is a fellow by the name of Dr. Mantegaza. And he wrote in 1859 on the dietic and medicinal properties of Ethroxylon coca, uh, which uh, became a very, very uh, popular uh, article and, and kind of awoken uh, the world to, to the qualities of coca. And this fellow right here is a fellow by the name of, oh, no, that guy, I think, was the inventor of cocaine. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, we'll mention him in a second. Uh, this is Mariani, who uh, was the inventor of coca wine, and uh, Vin Mariani, and that's his cellars at the Mariani factory. and. There's his coca wine bottle, and there's one of the most uh, famous of his advertisements. He also kind of invented uh, modern advertising with his uh, his promotion of his product. There's a couple images of the wine bottle, and this was what the physicians got their Vin Mariani in that type of bottle, and that was the wrapping on the bottle. And you can see um, there was many, many different uh, um, images that went to promote his, his Vin Mariani. And he put together these images and these advertisements in albums. And that's from one of the albums. It's another look at the bottle. Okay, so that other image was this fellow, Albert Nyman was a German who in 1860, uh, well, 1859, 1860, invented cocaine. This is a uh, another image of uh, from uh, Mariani's albums. And yet another one from Mariani's albums. And another, and you'll see there are many different Vin Mariani advertisements in various mediums. And this one is kind of the fountain of youth. Vin Mariani was like the elixir of the, like the water that came from the fountain of youth. And this one uh, by the artist uh, Mucha or Muka, uh, very famous artist, said that uh, Vin Mariani could um, awaken the dead, and mummies drank it. Um, this Doctor Mortimer. Uh, wrote uh, the history of coca, the big 1901 history of coca. Uh, he also was a big fan of Vin Mariani, and uh, that it was a uh, painkiller and euphoric medicine, amongst many other uses. And even children drank Vin Mariani. And you can see that one has like a pacifier. There's a baby drinking Vin Mariani. Uh, I don't know how much alcohol children should have, but apparently uh, the coca, the effects of uh, the coca leaf were medicinal to even children. Uh, the Pope drank Vin Mariani, but various popes enjoyed it and uh, had testimony to that effect. There were medals and medallions uh, made glorifying this drink, and you saw... It was endorsed by virtually everybody. Anyone who was everyone, everyone who was anyone, endorsed uh, Vin Mariani, and uh, their endorsements were collected and used as um, advertisements. Emil Zola, the author, Thomas Edison, the inventor, um, Jules Verne, another big, you know, science fiction writer of the uh, 19th century, and other popes. Kings, you name it, everybody loved this drink. And uh, the school children loved, uh, you know, Vin Mariani. 
And uh, even uh, Marianne even commissioned a children's book, uh, Le Chateau de la Grippe, uh, the, the flu castle. And in it, uh, there is, you know, the use of Din Mariani. As you can see in the corner there, the left-hand corner, there's a bottle of Din Mariani. And uh, the feature is prominent. There's uh, Mama Coca and the Coca shrub in her hand. And uh, these bottles of Din Mariani uh, that were uh, coming out of the alligator's mouth. And you can see the uh, art used in this uh, was kind of cutting edge for the time. Big newspaper ads, you name it. Uh, there was, I'm only showing you a fraction of all the ads that Vin Mariani created. But anyway, this popularized coca and popularized the drink. And it became very, very popular uh, as a stimulant, euphoric, aphrodisiac. Uh, and and good for tummy troubles, all kinds of problems. The flu it was used in, in cold medicine and flu medicine. Um, and there was, of course, uh, uh, people who copied uh, Mariani and put out their own coca wine. And you'll see in these ads here, there's uh, Armbrex was a popular coca wine, and they had that was his bottle. And um, let's see, McGee, Marshall, and Co. had their coca wine. And there was Peruvian wine of coca. There was Vin des Incas, Garcon, Coca des Incas, Savar's coca wine, a Hall's coca wine, and another, those are all Hall's coca wine ads here. Hall's coca wine is a marvelous restorative. And it was sold as a medicine. Uh, no prescription necessary, of course. That was later. That came later. The new food medicine, truly a wonder. Uh, Hazard, Hazard and Co. had their coca wine. But the bottle was suspiciously Mariani-like. And there's another Mariani bottle. And... Um, this is another image from the Coca Museum of Peru, and they collected all those different Coca wine bottles there in the display case, and there's a ton of them. And also, around 1885 or so, uh, a unknown psychoanalyst, actually that was before psycho, he invented psychoanalysis, a, um, a, a medical student or a recently graduated medical student named Sigmund Freud started experimenting with cocaine and he used it as a antidepressant and a euphoric and stimulant and aphrodisiac and and that uh, definitely helped to popularize it in the medical community uh, also as an analgesic or painkiller a uh, topical painkiller and then this is Pemberton's coca french wine uh, French wine coca, which is, of course, uh, uh, another knockoff of Vin Mariani. And this uh, was uh, created in Atlanta, Georgia in 1884, 85. And then in 1886, Atlanta went dry and uh, you were no longer allowed to sell alcohol. So the guy had to invent something else aside from uh, coca wine. Uh, so in Atlanta, he, oh, this is mixed up a little bit, but this is Freud and his wife, and they're using cocaine. So anyway, Pemberton, the guy who made the coca wine, he then made uh, Coca-Cola, uh, which was without wine and without the Damiana, which was another aphrodisiac uh, in the coca wine he made. He uh, used uh, coca and cola, the caffeine from the cola nut, and the stimulating properties of the coca plant. And uh, that's how Coca-Cola was invented. And from 1886 all the way to 1903 or 1905, Coca-Cola had cocaine in it. In fact, I found a few sources 
that uh, argue that there's still a trace amount of cocaine in Coca-Cola. Uh, ever since 1969, Coca-Cola has no longer had to prove there's no cocaine in the Coke. So there might be, you know, like one out of every five Coca-Colas you drink has a little tiny bit of cocaine in it. But these are early ads for Coca-Cola. And then you can see in 1886, um, Coca-Cola is being promoted at trade shows and exhibitions. And uh, these are early ads for Coca-Cola. The Pleasant Exhilarant, uh, containing the tonic properties of the famous coca plant and the cola nuts. Did Coca-Cola get a kick from cocaine before 1903? Oh, it most certainly did, yes. And uh, here, here's a, a letterhead from the Coca-Cola company uh, early on pre-1903. Delicious, refreshing, exhilarating, invigorating, definitely promoting the medicinal uh, properties of Coca-Cola. Tired? Then drink Coca-Cola. It relieves exhaustion. And you see these ads were uh, also everywhere. That, um, like Vin Mariani, Coca-Cola definitely um, reinvented advertising from their font to their script all the way to their approach. Visit our soda fount, Coca-Cola. We purchase our Coca-Cola direct from the manufacturer. The ideal brain tonic, you can see there. Uh, delicious, refreshing. These are a little bit later on. Oh, it satisfies the thirsty and helps the weary, right? So it's a stimulant. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's Pemberton. That's what Pemberton looked like. And there's Jacob's Pharmacy where Coca-Cola was first sold in Atlanta. Now this guy is a guy named Robert Louis Stevenson, who in, I believe it was 1886, wrote... Uh, a story called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And uh, rumor has it, he was super high on cocaine the whole time he wrote it, which accounts for the fact that he wrote it, I think, in 10 days. And this is a depiction of Sherlock Holmes injecting himself with cocaine, the 7% solution. And uh, the writer of Sherlock Holmes a guy named Arthur Conan Doyle. He was a doctor before he became a writer, so he would have been familiar with all these uh, cocaine-based medicines and coca wine. Yeah, Dr. Conan Doyle. Uh, and so that's what, uh, you know, the, the Coca USP, uh, United States Pharmacy, Pharmaceutical pharmacopoeia. Uh, this is what doctors would have had access to, uh, coca leaves. There's uh, Sherlock Holmes injecting himself again. And then this is a, a collection of images of pharmaceutical grade coca products. Uh, C.F. Boringer and Son, manufacturing chemist. This is a label from one of their, their bottles. And this is a pharmaceutical trade magazine of the time, uh, 1905. Yes, the largest makers in the world of cocaine muriate. They, we are the largest makers in the world of cocaine. So they, they had all these cocaine products for sale. And uh, prices no higher than for any other brand. They would advertise, and that's another label of theirs. And... Yeah, they were one of the big cocaine pushers of the, the era. And this is Eli Lilly, another major pharmaceutical company of the time. Coca leaves, Eli Lilly cocaine, high quality cocaine. And as you can see, all they had lots of cocaine products. Uh, there's These uh, slides are a little bit confused, but you get the idea. Uh, Park Davis. Another major, major pharmaceutical company uh, for many years. And that's their cocaine products for nausea. And these are uh, little tabs used um, for injection. 
And this is their cola compound, which contains some 40 grains of coca, probably cocaine, hypodermic tablets for your syringe, more nausea medicine, this one, 1919. Uh, John Wyeth, there's another major pharmaceutical company. They had some cocaine, they had fluid extract of coca leaves, tabloids for injection, more, more hypodermic needle tablets, and the powdered stuff too, of course. Squib, another major pharmaceutical firm. Malindroct, another one, major. American Druggist Syndicate, yeah, all Lloyd, they, all the biggies. There's another Park Davis. Those are coca leaves from Park Davis. Merck, huge pharmaceutical company, still active to this day. And that's a, a catalog of theirs. And as you can see, uh, they're, they've got leaves around their, their logo. Specifically, looking very much like coca leaves. And this is a, a Merck cocaine product uh, before 1906 because there's no tax stamp, no, no uh, poison designation. It's an early one. Now you can see uh, after 1906, you can see the, uh, the tax stamp and the poison designation there. But uh, Merck uh, went on to make cocaine for decades and decades. And you can see these bottles are more recent. They're from the 80s. Uh, you can see there, April 3rd, 1981, I believe, uh, on that box of Merck cocaine. And uh, cocaine was used in dentistry and surgery as a, a analgesic, a pain-killing um, substance. And this is a rock and roll <laughs> disco poster from 77 of Merck cocaine. And then they had uh, cocaine uh, drinks of various kinds and of lesser known pharmaceutical companies. Everyone was making compounds with coca in it. And you'd see Niles compound extract of Damiana. Damiana is an aphrodisiac and they put a little coca in there too. Uh, tablets for... Uh, sore throat it was an analgesic so it would uh, ease the sore throat there there's some Merck cocaine there's so many as you can see these tab lozenges um, all kinds of preparations oh so many of these Allenbury's cocaine lozenges uh, I just find their um, packaging so beautiful that uh, I collected them all for you here, but there are so many different types of Allenbury cocaine lozenges. Um, everybody apparently was sucking on these things uh, 120 years ago, give or take. Ritany was uh, for uh, tummy troubles. Cocaine, menthol, eucalyptus and cocaine. And they had advertisements for their lozenges that everyone was apparently using back then and because of cocaine's tendency to numb uh, the throat it was a very effective throat lozenge and also there were other throat lozenges midi in france had the same thing going on there uh, this vanderbroek uh, it looked like uh, another French coca-based lozenge. Coca-bola, which was like chewing cocaine. And um, the High Times did an article on uh, the smoking of cocaine, free base, uh, you know, basically crack, but uh, also the history of, of attempts to create um, a smokable form uh, in cigarettes. Um, let's 
too. There's some more small pharmaceutical companies. Even little drugstores had their own cocaine solution. That was the 7% solution that Sherlock Holmes liked to inject. There's uh, Scarface and his cocaine collection there. Brett's. Okay, so this is an ad for something called Burnett's Cocaine for the Hair. And it's from 1859, before the invention of cocaine. And it, it was uh, had nothing to do with the coca plant at all. It was all cocoa or coconut-based hair product. But uh, they had called it cocaine to make it sound more medicine-y. And uh, some of their advertisements um, from the late 1850s or early 1860s contained that spelling and then uh, later on they went to spell it cocaine to uh, differentiate it from cocaine products uh, but oh here we have the uh, coca rets uh, which are made of tobacco and coca leaf uh, little cigarettes that would uh, be very stimulating and um I think Park Davis also had a smokable form of coca leaf a, a product, but I, I haven't seen the package for it. And here are some bottles of fake cocaine bottles that you can buy off the internet that uh, people take actual labels and then put them on, uh, make photocopies of them and put them on uh, bottles from today and uh, kind of sell them as, well, sometimes pretend they're real and sometimes they they call them uh you know replicas uh, and here's a modern day cocaine uh bottle filled with uh, it's a nasal solution for topical use only not for injection but uh this is what cocaine is used for today uh as a painkiller in surgery and in, in dentistry and those are modern-day cocaine bottles. Uh, here are some natives of Colombia chewing coca. And this is uh, Dr. W. Golden Mortimer's History of Coca, which is uh, 1901, and it was the most comprehensive history of coca to date. The only real big one out there. And this is a coca plantation in Peru and th this is actually from uh, um, Mortimer's coca history and that is Mortimer and he was a uh, member of the Academy of Medicine of New York and the Academy of Sciences of New York and he only wrote one book in his life but it was quite a comprehensive and interesting book. He wrote, It has stood not only the mere test of time, coca, but has survived bitter persecution, wherein it was falsely set up as an emblem of superstition in a cruel war of destruction when the people among whom it was held as sacred were exterminated as a race. So he's talking about the persecution of coca chewers back in the 15, 16, and 1700s, is that they were worshipping the devil when they chewed coca. And here is uh, some stigma of uh, cocaine users in the black community in that, from 1905, from Atlanta. He wants cocaine, so he's breaking into a drugstore to get it. And this is a American flag designed by Mark Twain. And he designed it in reference to America's colonial uh, efforts in the Philippines. He uh, wrote, okay, here, this is uh, 1906, and Collier's uh, expose on patent medicines, which uh, led to, or this is 1905, the first one is 1905, and it led to the 1906 uh, Food and Drug Act, and which led to the Food and Drug Administration as well and labeling of drugs. But um, this is uh, the U.S. and the Philippines. As you can see, the American flag is right there. And and they uh, murdered a lot of people in order to control the Philippines. And here's the quote I was talking about from Mark Twain. 
And as for a flag for the Philippine province, it is easily managed. We can have a special one. Our states do it. We can have just our usual flag with the white stripes painted black and the stars replaced by the skull and crossbones. That's appropriate for two reasons. One, we did a lot of murdering, or the U.S. did a lot of murdering in the Philippines to uh, take it over as a colony. And two, the people who uh, took over the governance of the Philippines were uh, often, three times in fact, uh, members of the Skull and Bones Fraternity of Yale, which also uh, created the CIA and... um, When it was controlling the Philippines, it introduced drug prohibition to the Philippines as a kind of a proving ground for drug prohibition in the United States, which uh, it basically transferred these laws from the Philippines to the United States uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Here is Francis Burton Harrison, member of Skull and Bones, and the... uh, guy who the Harrison Narcotic Act was named for. He was basically uh, the person who introduced the first drug prohibition to the United States. He is also the governor of the Philippines. Funny coincidence? No, I don't think so. Here's a guy named William Howard Taft, also a member of Skull of Bones, also a governor of the Philippines. And he was the president under which Elihu Root began the international drug conventions and the drug treaties and basically global drug prohibition. Uh, Skull and Bones is a fraternity that uh, was basically founded by drug smugglers. Uh, I I write about this in my articles, uh, the first uh, series of articles called George Herbert Walker Bush, Biggest Drug Lord Ever and the connection between Skull and Bones and drug prohibition. And you can get the link for that in the collection of links we've provided for you here in this show. But you should look into that. Um, The Philippines was where the U.S. tried out their drug laws first before they brought them into the United States uh, 10 years later. Now, this is an issue of Ramparts magazine, which looked into the connection between CIA and drug trafficking. Uh, This is uh, from the month of my birth, May 1971. So people have been investigating CIA uh, drug pushing connections as long as I've been alive. This is a poem from Allen Ginsberg called CIA Dope Calypso. And Allen Ginsberg, um, uh, as well as being an early marijuana legalization activist, was also involved in uncovering the uh, CIA uh, drug smuggling, uh, drug, illegal drug smuggling connections. And uh, he tipped off, oh, this is a picture of Allen Ginsberg sitting on a plane shot down in the Bay of Pigs invasion, the U.S. Bay of Pigs invasion, which is also all about drugs. Uh, I write about that. This is Air America's uh, emblem and logo. Air America was a uh, airline, uh, I think one of the largest in the world, that was basically set up by the CIA to smuggle drugs out of the Golden Triangle. Um, and that uh, the Vietnam War should more probably, probably be known as the Vietnam Drug War because it was a cover for CIA drug operations in the Golden Triangle, interestingly enough. And so, yeah, Ginsburg alerted this Alfred W. McCoy to... Uh, the CIA drug smuggling connections, and he wrote a book about it called The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia. I think this is 1972. And then uh, later on, it was um, improved on and put out again as The Politics of Heroin. High Times, Expose, the Cocaine Fascists Who Rule Bolivia. High Times was also an early um, investigative medium for the uh, connection between far right governments and cocaine smuggling. And this is a, a cover of a magazine called Overthrow, which was put out by the Yippies. And this is fall of 1987. This is an early um, investigation into 
Oh, here we go. Uh, right in the corner, you can see CIA Indigenous People Coke and Dope Connection. That's by uh, a friend of mine, Bill Weinberg, who wrote for both High Times and Overthrow and a bunch of other publications, too. And he was an early investigator into uh, Iran-Contra. And as uh, were these guys, the Christic Institute Inside the Shadow Government, which came out in 1988. Oh, here it is, Fall of 87, CIA Indigenous People's Coke and Dope Connection, right there. This is a image, a map, really, of an airstrip near Mena, Arkansas, where Barry Seal, the famous drug smuggler, brought in the cocaine and then have had his airplane serviced at the Mena Airport. And this is where a majority of the cocaine uh, came into the United States during the 1980s. And this was a CIA operation. Uh, here's another article by Bill Weinberg, George Bush, our super spy drug dealing president. And this is the connection between George Bush, who was another Skull and Bones member, president of the United States, and uh, organized uh, the Iran-Contra cocaine operation, cocaine smuggling operation into the United States. And again, you can read uh, the first eight chapters of, of my uh, articles on this subject in uh, the links provided. Also, if you have Vansterdam comics, I have a quite a big, large overview of, of this CIA drug smuggling connection in there. Over 100 pages in Vansterdam comics on the same topic. George Bush, the super spy drug smuggling president. You can read uh, Bill Weinberg's article. It's on the in the Internet Archive. And you can read it for free. Here's the hangars used for CIA black operations at the MENA airport. And there's uh, Extra Magazine's cocaine, uh, Contra Cocaine Connection report by Norman Solomon. And so this stuff got out, that was 97. Um, this this stuff got out all over the place by the 90s. Uh, this is 1994. North didn't relay drug tips about Contra aid flights, DEA says. Oh yeah, North didn't mention uh, the, that the Contras were involved in the cocaine. The reason North didn't mention it was uh, he was up to his neck in it himself. In his written statement, Friday North said Special Prosecutor Lawrence Welsh conducted a multi-million dollar seven-year inquiry into every conceivable aspect of my life and never once made any such charge or allegation. Sources close to the Walsh investigation said that the fact that questions about drugs and North were not acted upon or fully explored was in no sense an exoneration. So basically, every investigation into Iran Contra avoided avoided uh, looking into the drug stuff too much, if at all. Uh, during the uh, Oliver North hearings, some people held up a banner saying, "Ask about the cocaine." They were ignored, and uh, as you can see, he had things he talked to his lawyer about that he didn't want to share with the rest of the world, and uh, probably the cocaine smuggling was uh, high on that list. Here's a collection of, of some of the best sources of information on CIA drug smuggling inside the shadow of government by the Christic Institute, the great heroine Ku Henrik Kruger, Fleshing Out Skull and Bones. Um, that's a good one. Burying the Boys by Daniel Hopsicker. Um, the Drug War by Dan Russell. Defrauding America by Rodney Stitch. Compromised by Terry Reed, John Cummings. Uh, the Conspirators by Al Martin. Air America by Christopher Robbins, the Ramparts Magazine article. Dark Alliance by Gary Webb. Uh, of course, there were movies made about Gary Webb. Uh, the Kill the Messenger. The Politics of Heroin, Alfred McCoy. Vance Again Comics, and uh, possibly the best book on the subject, C The CIA as Organized Crime by Douglas Valentine, and then the four movies at the bottom, Air America, Double Crossed, uh, about Barry Seal, American Made, also about Barry Seal, and Kill the Messenger, about Gary Webb. Uh, all of these just kind of scratch the surface, but together, in total, you get a big picture about how the CIA is the biggest drug smuggling organization in the world, and they control 
a huge chunk of the illegal drug market, including much of the cocaine smuggling. So that's uh, an important fact and might explain why we can never end the war on hard drugs because uh, the man is making too much money off of them. Uh, this is this book's online too. You can find the link in in uh, the article I wrote, The Amazing World of the Coca Leaf. And uh, you should definitely read it if you want to understand what the CIA actually does in the world uh, as opposed to what they pretend to do. And here's a page from uh, Vansterdam Comics. This depicts how between 85 and 86, uh, the CIA, um, because they smuggled so much cocaine into the United States, the price dropped from $30,000 a key to $12,000 a key. They were flooding the market with cocaine. That's a lot of cocaine. They were bringing it in on cargo jets, billions of dollars worth of cocaine on cargo jets uh, every week. So, yeah, that's a major operation. This is a book by Thomas Sass called Ceremonial Chemistry, which compares how um, drug users are, are scapegoated and uh, how genocide is committed um, by those who persecute them. This is Elahu Root. He was hired by a uh, <clears throat> Skull and Bones member, Harry Stimson, out of law school. He set up the 1909 Shanghai Conference on Opium, which is the first international treaty, one of many. And um, yeah, he was uh, he wasn't a Skull and Bones member, but he was he was a, a associate of them and worked with them extensively on many things, including setting up the uh, international drug prohibition. And uh, the result of the treaties, and you can read from this little clip uh, the aim of the international treaties wasn't narcotics control the aim was to stigmatize useful plant medicines as it says here the aim of this draft convention is to simplify the law relating to narcotics control to simplify the international control machinery to ensure control of the cultivation and harvesting of narcotic producing plants and to achieve international prohibition of such activities as opium smoking opium eating and marijuana and coca leaf consumption. Notice how they, none of that is involved in hard drugs. It's all herbal medicines. They're really focused on the herbal medicines. They don't want anyone growing and using their own medicine. They don't want anybody being independent of the pharmaceutical companies and Coca-Cola. Strange uh, how that's uh, different to what they pretend to be doing, which is narcotics control, which we, you know you'd think making sure no one abuses heroin or something like that. But it's just about herbal medicine, really. Uh, there we have a couple of clips and advertisements for early cocaine movies. The Curse of Cocaine, 1909. Um, and there's the plot of For His Son, 1912. There's an ad for For His Son, which was another kind of cocaine cautionary tale. That's a clip, uh, an image from For His Son. There's another one. The Dopo Coco, the Dopo Coke Tired Feeling. For that Dopo Coke Tired Feeling, use this drink. Well, it's like supposed to be Coca Cola. Uh, and then this is um, The Mystery of the Leaping Fish, was another early movie from 1916. It starred Douglas Fairbanks in one of the early. Uh, silent films, and it was a spoof on Sherlock Holmes. He was guy, a detective named Coke Any Day, and he did a lot of cocaine in it. Uh, there is his cocaine collection. You can see his cocaine tin was <laughs> was like a cookie tin. It was huge. Uh, Douglas Fairbanks in The Mystery of the Leaping Fish. There's a kind of review of the movie. Uh, the comedy is a scream. Got rave reviews, and uh, there there is Douglas Fairbanks and just injecting himself with cocaine. And there's another movie uh, involving the use of cocaine, 1922, also known as While London Sleeps. And uh, yeah, you'd see a lot of these uh, cautionary tales come up in the 20s. Uh, the Vice of Humanity. It's a German film from 1927. Uh, the Pace That Kills, 
also known as Cocaine uh, 1928, or that one is from Cocaine 1922. And uh, yeah, I think this is a description of The Pace That Kills. Came out as a silent film in 1928, and then a talkie, uh, Cocaine Fiends, in 1935. Oh, that's a little bit out of place. That's Stop Killer Coke presentation. If you go to killercoke.org, you'll find out the connection between Coca-Cola and right-wing death squads. But here's back to the movies again. Cocaine Fiends, uh, also known as The Pace of Kills. And that's the uh, talkie version from 1935. And they had many movie posters and marquee posters from that movie. And there is uh, from the beginning of the film. Oh, Charlie Chaplin in 1936 came out with Modern Times and it has a cocaine scene in it as well. And then The Thrill That Kills is a cocaine movie from 1948, which I think was a version of an Italian film where it came out in, in different versions in different languages and it had a lot of movie posters too. Uh, Un Lettera al Alba is his other title. And there you have the marquees for that. Ah, 1969. You had a movie called Easy Rider, which began with a scene with Phil Spector shoving some cocaine up his nose with a spoon. Uh, he's had legal problems since then, but uh, this was back in the day, 1969. And then in 72, Superfly came out, which also dealt with cocaine. And Annie Hall, which was the... Uh, Woody Allen flick in 1977 had this famous cocaine scene where Woody Allen sneezes when he's not supposed to and all the cocaine. This is from Superfly, this one here. Uh, yeah, that Woody Allen flick just cracks me up every time I see it. That's what you're not supposed to do when you're doing coke with your friends there. Uh, and the, this is a clip from the uh, Charlie Chaplin film where... He, some uh, prisoner hides cocaine in the salt shaker and Chaplin gets a little bit up his nose and, uh, oh, he's stimulated. And this is, uh, of course, uh, I think it's 83, Scarface. Uh, the, um, the story was written by uh, Oliver Stone and Oliver Stone saw fit to suggest back in 83 that the U.S. was involved in cocaine trafficking. And here is our friend Charles Goodson from Washington. Nice to meet you. So Goodson was from Washington, probably the CIA. He might have uh, been represented by uh, one of Bush's lackeys at the time. And yes, yeah, Scarface. In this country, you get got to make the money first. Then when you get the money, you get the power. Then when you get the power, then you get the women. There it is, the classic formulation. How to... Uh, how to meet women in the United States. Uh, have mountains of cocaine on your desk. Okay, so this is a really interesting photo. This is from 2007. Each and every one of those bags is filled with kilos of cocaine. Uh, this was the result of a plane crash. And uh, it was in uh, Mexico. And uh, it came out on September 24th, 2007. Uh, Reuters and other news um, organizations reported on this plane crash. The plane that all this cocaine was on was used for CIA uh, rendition flights, which means uh, when they were taking someone from a country that did not allow torture to a country that did allow torture, they would use this airplane. So this is a CIA plane that crashed with... Oh, 3.3 metric tons of cocaine on it. Now, this was never investigated. Nobody found out what the CIA was doing in 2007 with 3.3 tons of cocaine. But this gives you an idea that the Iran-Contra cocaine operations never really ended. They just... Sometimes the CIA uses other organizations, uh, dummy companies or... or uh, 
military contractors to do their dirty work. And sometimes they do it themselves, but they're still involved in cocaine smuggling. And this is from yesterday. Colombia's most wanted drug lord captured. Otonil. Otonil. Now, the reason why this guy is the most wanted drug lord and none of the guys uh, working at the CIA are the most wanted drug lords is because we have a very racist society that only investigates non-white drug lords. And the white drug lords are uh, ignored. That's, uh, I, you know, it's an uncomfortable fact, but it's true. This is one of the ways white supremacy is maintained and uh, control of the world by the CIA, uh, all their assassinations, coups, and secret wars are funded by cocaine smuggling, and and uh, yeah, that's that's an important thing to to keep in mind when deciding whether to keep cocaine illegal or legalize it and take the money out of the hands of these murderers and and end the the stupidity. There he is. He's the guys who busted him are uh, doing selfies with him. And, yeah, in South America, there is no larger cocaine trafficker, says Toby Muse, author of Kilo Inside the Cocaine Cartels. We are living in the golden age of cocaine. We are producing more cocaine than ever. That's a fact. So I think the reason they're producing more cocaine than ever, aside from there always being a demand for stimulants and aphrodisiacs um, and euphorics, is that uh, they never really investigate the people who are doing the main organizing, and that is uh, the CIA and the military that are doing uh, most of the smuggling. Most wanted drug lord captured in Colombia. Again, this uh, most wanted drug lord, it's a testament to how we prioritize investigating. Bush got out of being investigated by saying, I was out of the loop, and then they took him at, took him at his word. And Ollie North, well, he was hardly investigated. He mentioned the, the involvement in, in cocaine, that the Contras were involved, that he wasn't involved. He was not investigated at all, and, and he did a few hours of community service. And Pablo Escobar, their business partner, was uh, shot on a rooftop in 93. So, and, and Freeway Ricky Ross, who was also kind of getting the product and distributing it, that the CIA smuggled in when he got, uh, I think, 20, 25 years, something like that. So if you're in, if you're white and, and powerful and part of the military, the CIA, you get away with not being investigated. If, if you're, uh, you know, from Latin America, you get shot. And if you're black, you get shot or long jail sentences. And that's the, that's the lesson. But the corruption is everywhere. This is a funny photo. Here he is, uh, some military guy in South America uh, came across a bunch of smuggled cocaine. And look, if you look closely uh, in his uniform, there is a package-shaped bulge uh, under his shirt. Uh, that's weird. What's that doing there? Well, uh, I think uh, everybody's involved uh, in the corruption part of this. And there's there's some physical evidence to that effect. And here we have some um, uh, record labels of uh, cocaine songs from the 20s. Uh, cocaine Blues, 27, Dope Head Blues, 1929, Cocaine Habit Blues, 1930, uh, Cocaine by Dick Justice, 1931, Minnie the Moocher, Cap Calloway, there is 1933, Cigarettes, cigars, had a mention of cocaine in it. Lead Belly had a cocaine song called Take a Whiff on Me. And that was from, I think, 35, 38, Wacky Dust, Chick Webb. 1939, The Ghost of Smokey Joe, another Cab Calloway mention of a coked up protagonist. Oh, Hoyt Axton, 1969. Now, a lot of those songs were sung again in the uh, 40s and 50s, but 1969, we start getting a whole new crop of cocaine songs. Hoyt Axton, Snowblind Friend. Oh, 1972, Black Sabbath, Snowblind. 1972, again, Curtis Mayfield with Pusher Man. 
1962, back to 62, uh, Cocaine. Uh, Bob Dylan did a version of this song. 1932, again, we're going back here. Uh, Minnie the Moocher, that was an animated feature by the Fleischer Brothers. Uh, and uh, Betty Boop was in it, and uh, they mentioned um, uh, one of the characters in it was Cokie. And uh, here we have a Station to Station uh, cocaine song by David Bowie. In fact, a lot of David Bowie's songs were written on cocaine. He did a lot of cocaine, and he's so famous for doing cocaine, somebody did a chart of his cocaine use. And and his, uh, he, he apparently in 1975 was the peak of his cocaine use there. Cocaine by Eric Clapton. Uh, his 1977 cover of a similar song by, um, oh, I forget who. There's Cocaine Adds Life, which was a collection of songs put out in 84 by David Bowie. There's another cover of it. Public Enemy, 1988, Night of the Living Bass Heads, which was a cautionary song about smoking free bass cocaine or crack cocaine. Uh, the Reverend Horton Heat put out a song called uh, Bales of Cocaine in 1993. And The Weeknd put out I Can't Feel My Face in 2015. And that's, of course, in reference to the cocaine's numbing analgesic effects. Cocaine, so much cocaine. I like that meme from Vice. What the weekend saying, I suppose, is that he's experiencing anesthesis in his face. That is, he's experiencing numbness. At least two questions emerge from the from this. What is numbness, and what does it mean when someone say says they are experiencing it? Says the Vice writer. Oh yes, J.J. Kale uh, wrote the um, song "Cocaine" that uh, Eric Clapton covered. A year later, in the more famous version. I can't feel my face when I'm with you, but I love it. Uh, the lyrics to The Weeknd's 2015 song. And, uh, yeah, popular t-shirt there. And these are different uh, types of coca leaves from different types of coca plants. There's, I think, hundreds of different types, but only four of them really produce uh, enough cocaine uh, to uh, warrant cultivation. And yeah, this one, uh, the the, la the last photo in this uh, image are both from the National Geographic uh, cocaine article, which I, and, and this one too, which I mentioned in the article I wrote, The uh, Amazing World of the Coca Leaf. And here are uh, different alkaloids found in the coca leaf. We'll get into that in the article too. These are the koji. Indians of Colombia, and uh, they're holding the little containers of the lime or broken up seashells or burnt quinoa that they use as a alkaline element to activate the ingredients in the coca leaf when they chew it. Here's a, a nutritional breakdown of the uh, minerals and vitamins in the coca leaf. It's quite high in calcium and in uh, protein and in uh, other um, vitamins and minerals. It's, it's quite a nutritious supplement. Ah, and here's an early image of uh, a Coca-Cola ad, the Ideal Brain Tonic. And another Vin Mariani ad, the standard preparation. And... Uh, Good for gastric complications, melancholia, which is depression, uh, stimulant, and all the properties of the coca leaf. And this is a, one of Mariani's publications, which he gave to physicians, uh, explaining the effects of coca. And an uh, image from one of his publications. Ah, and this is Andrew Wheel, who is writing for High Times, a gourmet coca... Taster's Tour of Peru, which is a High Times article. I think you can find that online. And the conversation, why coca leaf, not coffee, may always be Colombia's favorite cash crop. And it turns out coca leaf 
is a superior stimulant to caffeine in that there's no jitters or headache uh, withdrawal from using coca leaf. A 21-year-old died after drinking a protein shake with a caffeine supplement so powerful it knocked him unconscious. So when you extract caffeine from coffee or many other plants that contain it, it also comes out as a white powder. And um, really, uh, there's no real difference between caffeine and, and cocaine um, other than one is legal and one is not. So the... A legal one is far less dangerous because uh, people use it more sensibly, often. Uh, and there's rituals of respect and moderation. There's an educational element that doesn't exist in the black market. And uh, yeah, it, it's just uh, the prohibition adds a whole added layer of danger that doesn't exist in the legal market. So we can learn from our uh, regulation of caffeine and actually we can also improve upon our uh, educational elements of caffeine so that nobody dies of a caffeine overdose and then we can use that same model with cocaine when we legalize it it has to be legalized so we end the death squads and that we maximize harm reduction um, techniques caffeine overdose kills south carolina teen coroner rules yeah the people occasionally die of uh, caffeine overdose Ozzy Osbourne says he's on borrowed time after years of heavy drug abuse. So one of the most famous users of cocaine, Ozzy Osbourne, uh, admits that he almost died countless times over the years through heavy cocaine and alcohol use, and he's grateful to be alive today. So yeah, uh, the the uh, main thing about uh, cocaine harm reduction is uh, dose. Uh, tiny amounts moderation is the key to using cocaine properly and uh, being a rock star you tend to have an excess of it lying around and you you have this reputation for being excessive in your passions and your um, desires and uh, so you try to maintain that reputation and, and use heroic doses and it's not good for you oh here's a uh, issue number one of Cocaine Comics from, I think, the 70s, 1979 or 75. I can't read it there, but anyway. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, comicsjoint.com uh, has provided a wonderful high-def images of these Cocaine Comics covers. Ah, so... I collected them and put them here. Cocaine Comics number three. Cocaine Comics number two. Another image of Scarface. Uh, the CIA's Cocaine, which was, I think, um, a... Uh, oh, geez. Um, I forget what, um, what news... They, which uh, news uh, service provided that story, but it, it gets out once in a while. 60 Minutes, exactly, thank you. 60 Minutes uh, did a story on it in, I think, the early 2000s. Oh, here's Sigmund Freud and Carl Kohler, who, um, he, Kohler uh, basically um, pioneered the use of cocaine as an anesthetic in medicine, in surgery and, and such. And, Freud tipped him off to that being possible. And that's uh, Freud's 1885 paper on coca, uber coca. And there's Freud and his kids and his wife. And all his kids were born during the years he was using coca. So there's, there's evidence of it being an aphrodisiac. Oh, it is a um, cartoon from the time, A Marvelous Cure. Yeah, he died, my patient died, but he died cured. Cocaine's a marvelous cure. And this is one of uh, Freud's patients who was using cocaine and overused it and developed cocaine psychosis. So uh, apart from heart attacks and, and just overdosing on cocaine and dying, you can also... Uh, too much cocaine can drive you crazy. 
So let that be a lesson, kids. Moderation uh, in all things, especially uh, the hard drugs. Here's a pre-1930s cocaine um, mister, uh, atomizer, that would uh, stick that one end up your nose and squeeze the other end and uh, take the cocaine that way instead of a spoon. And here is from the National Geographic January 1989 edition where I got a lot of these images from. And uh, this is the green arrow is your pleasure signals. uh, And that number one, image number one, is a normal pleasure system. And um, image number three, I think, is uh, your pleasure system on cocaine. And image number four is your pleasure system after using too much cocaine. It doesn't work anymore. The signal isn't sent anymore. So you can you can uh, abuse cocaine and use it immoderately to the extent that you're no longer able to feel pleasure, at least for a while anyway. Uh, that is uh, one of the ways you can abuse cocaine. DMX died of a cocaine-induced heart attack. Uh, so yeah, there's a, that was a story from January 9th, 2021. It was an, another uh, thing to keep... Keep watch for immoderate use can lead to heart attacks. And so uh, there's different ways to get off cocaine, one of, one of which is iboga or ibogaine, uh, which is a withdrawal interfering herbal medicine. And though there's not a lot of uh, physical withdrawal symptoms, uh, there's a psychological withdrawal with cocaine. So the iboga might help you with that. And this is a list of legal prescription stimulants. Uh, None of these are less dangerous than cocaine. They're just different. They're just patented, right? So um, you can see why uh, the pharmaceutical industry would be interested in maintaining uh, cocaine uh, prohibition because they want to outlaw their competition, their competition that farmers can supply so that they can monopolize selling uh, substitutes for cocaine. Ah, this is a uh, cover of uh, uh, one of uh, the versions of the the Diary of a Drug Fiend, which is Aleister Crowley's uh, Tales of Cocaine and Excess. And there is uh, kind of the modern day film version of that, uh, the Wolf of Wall Street with um, Leonardo DiCaprio uh, doing cocaine from the anus of a prostitute, I believe. Ah, here is a uh, cartoon from 1900 where a little girl is picking up a soothing syrup, which probably contains uh, opiate. And on the counter there in front of her is an opium um, bottle and a cocaine bottle. Uh, Oh, there's back to Leonardo DiCaprio doing cocaine off his mistress's uh, breasts. Back to the cartoon again of the child having access in 1900 to uh, these hard drugs. Oh, now we're going to the 1500s and how the uh, original stigmatizers and demonizers of cocaine said that it, using it was like um, it was the, the effect of uh, cavorting with the devil. And we get into that in the scapegoating section of my article, how uh, the cocaine was associated with devil worship and, and making deals with the devil. And here is a Bolivian uh, cocaine plantation or coca leaf plantation from the 1800s. And here is uh, one in Indonesia. And that that's a bunch of co- coca leaf being pounded into powder in Indonesia in the, I think, the 40s. This is a proclamation from the King of England, 1675, uh, for the suppression of coffee houses. And you can see that different substances, substances are scapegoated by elites uh, to suppress uh, counterculture or anything they find threatening, any any people they wish to uh, control, subjugate, 
or anyone they fear. They just say, okay, what drugs are they doing? We'll say those are bad drugs, and we'll, uh, we'll argue they should be suppressed, and then we'll have the effect of suppressing the people. This uh, suppression of coffee houses only lasted a few days, and then the, there were riots in the streets, and the king said, okay, 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 you can have your coffee houses back, just no treasonous talk in those coffee houses. This is an ad um, that uh, protests Coca-Cola's involvement in human rights ab abuses um, from uh, in advance of the World Cup in 2022. So this is still going on. There is a song about it uh, called Coke is the Drink of the Death Squads. You can find that on YouTube. And you can have more information on Coca-Cola's human rights abuses and links to evidence of that in my article. Here is an image of the coca pickers uh, from the 1600s, uh, I think in Peru. And here is a shot taken from Killer Mike of Run the Jewels fame. Uh, before he joined Run the Jewels, he did a song called Reagan, which he talks about how drug prohibition is used uh, to control uh, the black population in the United States. And it's quite a good song. You should check it out. Uh, more stigma. Here is The Case of the Dope Dealers by Martin Fraser. Uh, I think it's an Australian uh, pulp fiction novel. But you can see there's the white... Uh, law enforcement officials dealing with the black dope dealer. And uh, yeah, that's a common theme. You'll see that a lot. Oh, um, uh, Coca-Cola. Uh, no, a Vin Mariani ad from 1886. They're jumping back and forth in a lot of these. And this is how the Spaniards abused their African slaves from 1600. So you can see that white supremacy uh, is, is uh, maintained uh, by a, a lot of the time by uh, uh, drug prohibition. Cocaine and the fiendish Negro women. So here's a collection of different clips of news articles that I refer to in my article about uh, how uh, cocaine, Negro cocaine fiends keep showing up. The cocaine habit is increasing. In the newspapers around 1890s, the late 1890s and the early 1900s, um, there was a campaign in the press to uh, stigmatize cocaine users and uh, make them out to be depraved Negroes that need to be whipped, jailed, or lynched, and that they were impervious to... Uh, gun bullets uh, they when they were all coked up they would rape white women and uh and couldn't kill them with guns this was of course to not only uh, um stigmatize the black population of the united states but also um stigmatize cocaine users to make cocaine a prohibited substance uh Basically, it would enrich the pharmaceutical companies in that they could monopolize substitutes, and it could also enrich uh, the uh, cocaine smugglers, who also <laughs> sometimes uh, happen to be the people in power, and uh, po politicians and uh, military. So the increasing use of Coca-Cola as a stimulant and this is why Coca-Cola got uh, decoconized their their product. It was because around the turn of the century, around 1900, 1901, um, these uh, cocaine, coconized Negroes, many violations of the act are reported while the use of the drug among Negroes is growing to an alarming extent, this report stated. Uh it is stated that quite a number of the soft drinks dispensed at soda fountains contain cocaine and that these drinks serve to unconsciously cultivate the habit with the user. So here you have it, uh, the uh, demonization of, of the use of cocaine in the Negro population and the, tying it all to the soft drinks, these soda fountain drinks. And that's why cocaine 
has been taken out of Coca-Cola because they didn't want the bad press anymore. Daily, our children are exposed to the lure of cocaine and innocent-seeming soda fountain preparations, right? Negro cocaine fiends, again, this is just everywhere in the news at the time. This is uh, a report on the government growing uh, coca plants amongst other poison plants or psychoactive plants in their garden in Virginia, which was destroyed uh, to make way for the Pentagon. Fun fact. And here's more stigmatization in the Atlanta uh, newspaper. The dream of cocaine joy. Oh, you you have riches. You're like a queen. And then the after effects uh, come down off it and you realize you're not a queen. This is a label of Coca-Cola syrup uh, mentioning that the cocaine has been taken out. Uh, extract from coca leaves, cocaine removed, it says. And then after 1905, uh, well, yeah, you get this 1906 ad, which mentions, uh, oh, there's no cocaine in uh, Coca-Cola anymore. And then no more mention of it since then, 1906. It was, oh, athletes are drinking uh, Coca-Cola. No cocaine in it. But uh, yeah, so this is all over. Um, the news, and then the people who took advantage of this. Uh, this is the first delegation to the Opium Conference at The Hague, organized by Elahu Root. And the, there's uh, Hamilton Wright at left, and he was the main guy uh, who uh, promoted drug prohibition in the United States, which resulted in the Harrison Act in 1914. But he wrote... Uncle Sam is the worst drug fiend in the world, and he was the one who promoted the myth of the uh, Negro cocaineized rapist. And here's a racist cartoon about what the U.S. will do in the Philippines, and they're, you know, seen as the adults, and the Filipinos are seen as the children in that relationship. And there is Francis Burton Harrison, new governor general of the Philippines. Again, he's the big adult, and the Filipinos are the children in that relationship. And this is them implementing and uh, using the Philippines as a proving ground for the, the drug laws. Drug-crazed minds killed merchant science theory. Right, so this is a murder that was, uh, people guessed it was cocaine fiends. Uh, and it turned out not to be. Uh, American drug fiends outnumber Chinese, 1914. This is right around the passing of the first drug laws in the United States, and just the racism. Negro cocaine fiends are a new southern menace. Yeah, that's another another one. That was the New York Times, uh, February 8th, 1914. Murder and insanity increasing among the lower class blacks because they have taken to sniffing since deprived of whiskey by prohibition. Right. And that's a cartoon from around that time. To, I think it was 1911. And uh, tea, coffee, and coca were one of the steps towards uh, a drunkard's grave. Negro cocaine fiend kills police chief. Lyn lynching threatened. Serious collective punishment here. All citizens of Shoshone have ordered all Negroes to leave the city. That is uh, threatening them with lynching unless every black person in Shoshone, Idaho, leaves. So that's ethnic cleansing, and that's uh, collective punishment, which was, at the time, illegal. Interestingly enough, uh, from the, uh, the Hague Convention, 1899. No general penalty or otherwise can be inflicted on the population on account of the acts of individuals for which it cannot be regarded as collectively responsible. There's another picture of Hamilton Wright. And so what he did was he got the um, drug laws to become uh, adopted internationally, first in the uh, International uh, Drug Convention 1912, and then he slipped it into the Treaty of Versailles, so in 1919. 
everybody had signed on to it around the world, and that's how they got drug prohibition to be globalized. Sneaky, sneaky. In 1917, uh, this magazine, The International, published an article called Cocaine by a guy named Alistair Crowley. And it's actually quite a good article. I mean, there's things in it I disagree with. You can read it online. But he has some very uh, unique insights into the problem of, of drug abuse and proper drug use. And he's kind of a pioneer in that respect. So i got to admire the beast for, for doing that. And then this is 1919, Dope Darling, A Story of Cocaine. Our eyes are so wide in that. This is from 1922, the San Francisco Examiner. And there's uh, one of the cocaine dealers of the time or drug dealers of the time. And their false heel where they used to, to conceal the drugs they sell. Oh, a recipe for making cocaine from coca leaves from the Coca Museum of P Peru. Thank you, Google Maps for providing the recipe. Great. Uh, Google Translate will uh, help you turn that into English, and then uh, you can take that simple five-step process and uh, make your own. It, they try to pretend that uh, making cocaine is so complex. They're just really, really simple kids. And this is, I think, from the 20s as well. Um, the, the Asian drug dealer uh, preying upon the... Uh, white victim a common theme at the time drug habit gripping 2.5 million americans seen as a national calamity if unchecked uh, i think that's the 20s so they needed more drug laws then uh 1924 cocaine story and that's from around that time too 1924 25 the uh one on the left is on cocaine, eyes wide, and one on the right is uh, is taking an opiate, got the kind of eyes closed. From 1926, uh, Julia Bruns tells her confession how the scene in Quand on Ames, Alms had to be screened over three times because she ranted through it under the influence of cocaine. So there's early cocaine Hollywood connection. And there's a depiction of a woman who's haunted by cocaine and then later becomes addicted. And here's a history of amphetamines, which was the pharmaceutical substitute for cocaine after cocaine was criminalized. And another cocaine story, Les Forcas de la Neige, or the snow, which is a name for cocaine. And I think this is from a, a play from 1926 called Cocaine. A movie from Germany uh, about vice, including cocaine. Detective magazine from France, La Drogue de Qui Tue. Police magazine, Poison Blanc, White Poison. No Bed of Roses. And the 20s or 30s, we're getting into the early 30s. Les Paradis Artificial, Artificial Paradise, The Woman, something, something, cocaine. Ah, that's an image from a cartoon that we haven't seen yet, but uh, there's laughing gas and cocaine mixture. That's from the 30s. And this is uh, where we get the image of Santa Claus we know of today as the uh, white bearded. Uh, old jolly old man who's fat and is wearing red. That's a Coca-Cola ad. That's uh, Coca-Cola brought us Santa Claus. Oh, and here's that cartoon, uh, the Post Surrealist in Punch magazine, which I guess was responsible for the invention of the cartoon. And so, from 1936, there is uh, a Post Surrealist painting, and uh, under the influence of laughing gas and cocaine. That's how they did it back then, I guess, according to Punch. And then this is from a 1947 report by these uh, stigmatizers. And I will find the title page of that. Here we are. Carlos Gutierrez Noriega and Vincent Zapata Oritz. 
And this is where they argue that the coca chewers are uh, drug abusers. And the proof they use, uh, some of the proof they use, is that uh, these dogs are so addicted to cocaine, they will uh, hop up on a table and lie down and say, here, administer the cocaine to me. This is how they get the injections. So they'll get themselves all ready to be injected with cocaine. They're so addicted. Now, uh, the guys at the United Nations responsible for criminalizing coca chewing, uh, the committee responsible for that decision was uh, uh, chaired by the head of Burroughs Welcome. And uh, Burroughs Welcome produced cocaine. So uh, the guys selling cocaine were the same guys globally prohibiting the use of coca leaves. Very interesting fact there. That's in my article. And uh, yeah, this is uh, part of the United Nations stigmatization of coca chewers. They're all poor. They're poor because they're chewing coca leaves. And uh, that's how one of the ways they stigmatize coca chewers. Upper Amazonic tribes are also addicted to the chewing of coca leaf. Again, this is from the United Nations. They're using a photo from Richard Evans Schultes, who <laughs> was not a prohibitionist, but the United Nations shamelessly used his photo to stigmatize the coca users and call them addicts instead of people with an intelligent preference to a medicinal herb. And that's a photo from the UN reports. And that's another one. Uh, and uh, yes, this is all from the United Nations efforts to stigmatize coca users. And yeah, uh, really, um, the people who are suffering in third world countries in Latin America were suffering not because of the use of cocaine. They were suffering from the oppression uh, experienced by various elites, elite groups, either the Spaniard um, conquest uh, conquistadors or the hacienda owners, the landowners later on, or the CIA today. And in the United States, there's a Coca-Cola vending machine with a white customers only written right on it. And that photo is from 1961. So um, this uh, subjugation and white supremacy has gone on a long time. And the use of these uh, drugs and the prohi prohibition of these drugs have been used uh, as a tool of the white supremacists. There's, speaking of which, there's Nixon, 1971, and he's laughing with his buddies as they institute uh, even harsher drug laws. Nixon seeks $155 million to defeat drug enemy. This is drug abuse is public enemy number one. <laughs> and that's uh, how Nixon did it, June 18, 1971. A couple years later, he introduced the DEA, and that is from the 70s. I think that's from 79. There's a book on cocaine. Nixon's War on Drugs. In 1971, the President Richard Nixon imposed a war on drugs, stating that drug possession was public enemy number one. Since then, drug use and abuse have been treated as criminal issues handed, handled through incarceration and punitive measures. So, yeah, the, the drug prohibition began really uh, in 1914. Uh, marijuana was criminalized in 37, but the drug war was ratcheted up and put into high gear in uh, the 70s by Nixon uh, and also uh, in the state of New York by uh, uh, Nelson Rockefeller and the Rockefeller Laws, which uh, produced mandatory minimums. Rocky asks life for pushers. And then you can see uh, the uptick in arrests and um, incarcerations, starting with Nixon there, and then, whoo, with Reagan, 1984 Sentencing Reform Act, it just went exponential, and you see a massive increase in incarceration. That's from 1983. Agents at the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration's office in New York City survey some of the 440 pounds of cocaine seized from a Queens apartment. So these are, you know, competitors with the CIA who they round up and take out so that they can pretend they're doing something about drugs. 
And yeah, that's uh, 1980 versus 2018 number of people in prison and jails for drug offenses. That's uh, the 1980 is the gray bar and 2018 is the red bar. And you can see a huge difference in jail, jailing people in, in the drug war. So here's four members of the frat uh, fraternity Skull and Bones at Yale. William Howard Taft, the only man in history to be both President of the United States and Chief of the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, Henry Louis Stimson, Secretary of War under Taft. Uh, also, I think, <clears throat> uh, served in many um, presidency cabinets. Francis Burton Harrison, uh, the uh, person who the Harrison Narcotic Act was named after, and George Herbert Walker Bush, Skull and Bones 48, also president of the United States. So, yeah, these guys had a lot to do with drug laws and drug enforcement, and um, their connection with Skull and Bones isn't an accident or coincidence. There's Bush with Noriega, December 10th, 1983. Uh, that was his partner in crime, really. One of one of the people he cooperated with to get the drugs into the United States. There's another partner in crime. That's Bush and uh, a guy named um, Felix Rodriguez, who is a, a Bay of Pigs um, veteran and uh, one of the, the guys uh, in his ass assassinating Fidel Castro. Uh, group. Uh, he actually managed to catch Kate Che Guevara in Bolivia and assassinate him, help assassinate him. And uh, yeah, same group of guys uh, also assassinated uh, Kennedy, both Kennedys, and um, John Lennon. And you can read about it in uh, Vance the Damn Comics. And uh, and part uh, the Kennedy parts in in uh, the link we provide George Herbert Walker Bush biggest drug lord ever part two uh, you can read about these guys drug lords drawing up medical cocaine supply yeah that's from 1989 um, it's uh, the hypocrisy is, is that Stepan and Coca-Cola and uh, those guys are like hey 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 you're your drug prohibition's messing with our action here. Oh yeah, and there's Bush's other uh, co-conspirator in in this cocaine operation, Ollie North, who only did a, a few hours of community service for his his cocaine crimes. So yeah, you got to read up on these guys. Black men are roughly five times more likely to be imprisoned than their white counterparts, and nearly thirteen times as likely in the eighteen to nineteen age group. Right, so. White supremacy is boistered and always has been by these drug laws. That's Tom Coleman, who, in uh, a place called Tulia, Texas, arrested, I think, a third of the black population uh, and planted or pretended to have found cocaine on all of them and trumped up all these charges. And the media in Tulia said, Tulia streets cleared of garbage. This is uh, two, uh, 1999, I think. Yeah, 1999. And uh, so it's continuing to this day. Drug laws are used uh, to target the black population and, I guess, commit, in this case, ethnic cleansing of black populations in Texas. Um, and this is in an isolated case. This is just one of the cases that was exposed. Oh, this is uh, <clears throat> 2003 drug raid uh, on school children and um, geez, it was the Stratford High School in uh, Goose Creek uh, and they went after the black kids with uh, loaded Glock guns and drug dogs and uh, didn't find a thing. So the ACLU uh, took them to court and said, you never can do drug, drug raids like that ever again. 
Uh, this is another interesting chart, drug arrest rates. So this isn't just convictions and incarcerations. This is arrests. And uh, the, the blue dots are blacks and the uh, red triangles are whites. And this is uh, the Reagan administration. You can see blacks have always been arrested at higher rates than whites. But when Reagan got into power, uh, that skyrocketed. And so, uh, yeah, it's the police as well that are part of the white supremacy um, system. And people like Kate Moss, who snorted cocaine at Nelson Mandela's house, was photographed doing it. Well, she doesn't go to jail for it because she's white and beautiful. And uh, But, you know, well, some black guy is definitely going to jail for that. Cocaine Kate. Kate Moss getting photographed again doing cocaine. <clears throat> and here's a cartoon kind of uh, explaining that. Just so we're clear, I didn't pull you over due to racial profiling. It's just that most criminals look like you, right? So here's a great quote from William S. Burroughs, a really interesting beat poet writer. He wrote Junkie and was uh, always involved in, in drug policy. He wrote, uh, or he said, in the film Drugstore Cowboy from 1989, he said, Narcotics have been systematically scapegoated and demonized. The idea that anyone can use drugs and escape a horrible fate is an anathema to these idiots. I predict in the near future, right-wingers will use drug hysteria as a pretext to set up an international police apparatus. Was he right? Probably. Uh, in the Philippines right now, the death squads are going around killing people, even not guilty of drug trafficking, but suspected of drug trafficking. And they're being killed in the tens of thousands. And that's going on right now. This is, uh, I believe, just uh, stats from 2017. And it's gotten worse since then. And so, yeah, the drug war is a horrible genocide against uh, mostly peaceful people, farmers and gardeners, and sometimes against violent people, um, but violent because of the uh, effects of drug prohibition, not because of the effects of the drugs. And there you see uh, some people from, I believe, Colombia. And... Uh, they're selling their cocaine, and these people are drying coca leaves. And these people are chewing coca leaves, but these are the people who are affected most adversely by the drug prohibition laws, and they should be allowed to sell, uh, I think, their coca leaves all over the world without being interfered with. Maybe, maybe have some organic standards on that so we don't have the problems that come with chemical pesticides and chemical fertilizers. But other than that, I don't see, uh, or, you know, to avoid contaminants and adulterants. But apart from those things, the regulations are just harmful to people, the prohibitions especially. And this is a image taken from a frontline uh, special on the president's orders, which is about the Philippines and Duterte's deadly campaign against drug dealers. And that is... Uh, the uniform of the Filipino death squads that they wear when they go around shooting suspected drug dealers there. So unless we want it to get that bad here, we've got to legalize all drugs globally everywhere. And this is an anti-coca squad digging up or poisoning um, coca plants in Latin America. Colombia proposes to resume aerial spraying of coca fields. That was banned for a while, but they don't. They just spray from the ground now, and uh, they want to go back to spraying from the air. Uh, that's wrong. Coca is a wonderful medicine when used properly, and it's always, almost always used properly when it's in its whole plant form, with all 14 alkaloids being used uh, to everyone's benefit. So they should just let people use coca whenever they want, and then maybe have cocaine by prescription or at least have a it legal but uh, a major educational uh, campaign to promote moderate use. 
So here's a guy named Evo Morales, who is uh, president of Bolivia, and he used to be a coca farmer. And he chewed coca leaves at a United Nations uh, session, I think, uh, 2009. He wrote, the mastication of the coca leaf, mastication being chewing, mastication of the coca leaf is this. And he puts it in his mouth. No big deal. It does not harm anybody. And he is right. It doesn't harm anyone. That's an uh, image, a uh, photo of uh, Morales from 77. That's what he looked like in a suit. He didn't wear a suit when he was president, though. He just open shirt, really. No tie. And uh, Coca Rehab, Evil Morales, rebrands Bolivia's sacred leaf. Um, and so uh, ever since Morales uh, came out in favor of, you know, normalizing and destigmatizing uh, the coca leaf, uh, you get a lot of press on it, and he got a lot of attention and um, started a movement, really, to regulate, normalize coca chewing and the use of the coca leaf. Bolivia pushes for legalization of coca leaf chewing and growth, and that was from 2012. Um, Bolivia legalizes chewing and ingesting coca leaves. I think that's 2013. So he was in power 13 years and nine months from 2006 to 2019. And uh, he won with sizable majorities uh, each time, even after in 2014, after he legalized uh, the coca chewing, he was still reelected. And uh, I think we can learn a lot from Evo Morales and his approach. And we should definitely legalize the importation of coca leaves, uh, educate people about it, their benefits, and normalize it and help replace coffee and tea with, or at least augment coffee and tea use with coca use as another stimulant. Ah, yes. The United Nations still committed to completely to their drug war, even though elements of the United Nations educate about drug peace. Uh, the uh, leadership from kind of from the top down. Uh, this is follow-up of the 2019 Ministerial Declaration, strengthening our actions at the national, regional, and international levels to accelerate the impl implementation of our joint commitments to address and counter the world drug problem. So from the top, the leadership of the United Nations is still committed to drug prohibition in spite of everything. And this is the legal status of cannabis around the world. Legal for recreational use is the countries in blue. Uh, legal for medical use are the countries in green and the states, U.S. states in green, and illegal is the gray. And so as you can see, there's more and more uh, places cannabis is legal, especially in the Western world and in developed countries. But uh, yeah, it's starting to spread all over. And... Uh, the UN is still committed to wiping out cannabis. And this is a, uh, a series of articles produced by a group within the United Nations who uh, kind of produced this rebel paper, which was suppressed after it was published in uh, 95, uh, basically saying that uh, coca and cocaine should be legalized. The Natural History of Cocaine Abuse, a Case Study Endeavor, this is the confidential and suppressed report, and some of it's still online. And this is un, undip or undrip uh, the rights of the indigenous peoples. And uh, Article Twenty Three and Article Twenty Four mentions Article Twenty Four mentions uh, indigenous people have the right of their traditional medicines and to maintain their health practices, including the conservation of their vital medicinal plants, animals, and minerals. Indigenous individuals also have the right to access without any discrimination to all social and health services. So there you have it. Um, uh, parts of the United Nations are actually anti-prohibitionist, and uh, they have to be listened to, and the parts that are prohibitionist have to be ignored, and those treaties have to be either amended or um, abandoned. There's a Bolivia coca farmer... It's not doesn't look too old. It looks about seven or eight years old, and she's helping to dry 
helping her family to dry the coca leaves. Yeah. 2016, Vin Mariani came back and is produced in, um, oh, it was a Corsica. Anyway, uh, they're making Vin Mariani again. Uh, the bottle's a little different, but uh, I think it has extract of coca in it. So uh, you can buy that again. So coca is kind of returning to a certain level of, uh, of legitimacy and dignity. Uh, th- these are coca-, coca pain relief patches available in Vancouver at the Coca Leaf Cafe, where I work. And that's the sign outside the Coca Leaf Cafe. It also is a mushroom dispensary. So the non-proprietary medicines that have been st- stigmatized, demonized in society, they're all returning to use again. This is a mural in Peru. Uh, and there's, uh, you can see on the right-hand side, a woman holding a bunch of coca leaves in a bowl full of coca leaves there. And this is apparently the uh, biggest mural in Latin America. And these are different images from that mural. Uh, You can see a woman in front of it to scale. It's huge. And greatest mural of Cusco, uh, Cusco, Peru, considered the biggest mural of South America. And there is a close-up of the coca leaf holding woman. And that's what coca leaves look like in coca tea, what you get in, say, Peru or Bolivia. And uh, there's packaging for coca tea. And there's uh, the popular brand of coca tea. And these are the different types of coca tea that made it up to Vancouver in uh, the Herb Museum that I used to have here in <laughs> where we're sitting right now in the Pod TV studio. Uh, and these are different brands of coca candies. And, oh, these are coca leaves on the money on banknotes of uh, Peru. You can see the coca leaves here. I'll show you. Look there, Anil. You see the coca leaves on the banknotes of Peru? Yeah. So they have that on all their bills, their coca leaves there. That's another mural. I think that one... Uh, I'm not sure exactly where that is, but it's in South America somewhere. Coca leaves. And then these are posters, I believe, of different groups advocating for the legalization and return of coca all over South America. And so there's a movement uh, to legalize coca leaf and coca chewing. Here's a great quote from Bill Hicks. Come on, everybody, let's be hypocritical bastards. It's okay to drink your drug. We meant those other drugs, those untaxed drugs. Those are the ones that are bad for you. And that is a partly why drugs are illegal, not only uh, to finance the death squads and the secret wars, assassinations and cues, but also to control people through taxation. And if you have a botanical substance that people can grow for themselves, it's harder to tax it than it is to tax substance that uh, pharmaceutical companies can monopolize and control. And there's another Park Davis coca cocaine product uh, for injection injections of cocaine. Oh, and that's uh, the Peruvian... Uh, cocaine reserves uh, that uh, Peru uses to supply pharmaceutical companies with cocaine for surgery and dentistry. That's the legal cocaine supply right there. And this is uh, one of the harm reduction pamphlets on safer cocaine use that are out there. Uh, And these are packages, uh, labels on packages that were supplied in Vancouver of uh, examples of uh, pure cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamines that were handed out by drug peace activists who wanted to see these legalized. And how to regulate stimulants is a report on how to legalize cocaine. And there's a suggestion of cocaine packaging, of legal cocaine packaging for recreational use i guess and this is the legal status of cocaine map and the blue is legal 
Uh, the light blue is legal for medical use. Uh, yellow or mustard is decriminalized. And the red is illegal. So there you have it. Uh, cocaine is kind of following in uh, cannabis's footsteps in that there are places now where its consumption is legal, and uh, there is a growing awareness of both coca leaf and cocaine in the world. It's another herbal medicine that should be utilized properly and definitely legalized everywhere around the world. And there, I think, is the last image of a coca chewer with the bulge of uh, coca leaves in one of his cheeks, uh, the Koji Indian Shaman. Um, and that is the proper use of coca leaves. And, uh, looks like he's, uh, he's not suffering due to the use of his coca chewing. It actually helps people with tummy problems, uh, altitude sickness. So if you're living up in the Colombian, uh, mountain range and you're up in high altitudes, it'll help you manage that situation. So it's a tool, it's a use as a medicine, and it can be used properly. That was the end of the presentation. Uh, my name is David Malmalavine, and this has been a Pot TV presentation on coca leaf and cocaine, and how they should both be legalized and uh, proper use should be encouraged, because people can use these plant medicines properly if they're used with moderation and respect, and definitely. Uh, we should legalize them so that um, um, the death squads can be, uh, um, they can uh, have their funding removed and that the pharmaceutical companies no longer have absolute control over our uh, medicine, sources of medicine, and that people uh, evolve into completely medically autonomous people who are, are in control of their medical choices and sometimes uh, uh, in control of their medical e economies and their medical supply. Um, so th that's the insight I got from this. I hope you enjoyed this show and check out the links we've provided in the link section of this show. Stay, uh, stay happy, hungry, relaxed, inspired and focused and puffed up. Keep your heads held high and uh, learn all about all the herbs, not just cannabis. But the other ones, too, they're all quite handy uh, when you use them properly.